Well, thank you for coming, Virginie. Thank you so much for having me. I was so close to going to your show at Lyon d'Or last Thursday. I really wanted to see it. It was like 7.30. And then I realized I could watch your Cosmos show. Oh, you watched it on, on the ECC. TV? Oh, really? <laughs> yes, it was amazing. Thank it was you so, so much. cool to see. And that's, um, you know, just to tell you a little bit about my podcast, too, I kind of like to get a bit nerdy with the way people work and how they create comedy. First of all, thank you so much, too, for doing this in English. Mais, oh, my God. Thank you. Sorry if uh, I lack vocabulary and I make a few uh, mistakes uh, with syntax wise. Because well, uh, this is the first conversation I've had in English in a while. Are you <laughs> yes. serious? Well, once I saw that you studied, you, didn't you go to McGill in yes, English? Yeah, but I did French literature. <laughs> oh, yeah. Really? French literature? Yeah, in they a, have like the best... Ang like pretending to be an anglophone almost or no, no, well no they have like the whole french department is in french you know and it's one of the best french literature departments in in quebec oh, at mcgill okay. but i did a minor in russian studies too i wanted to learn many languages and so and mcgill had the best program so i went to mcgill but most of my university i did in french but at mcgill oh okay so yeah so but you're I, very bilingual but i have i i used to be more bilingual but I speak a little bit of Spanish. I speak a little bit of Russian. I learned a little bit of Portuguese during the pandemic. I'm really into languages. I'm but so like, not surprised. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's just like they leave your brain, you know? I used oh, yeah, to, totally. I used to be more fluent in English. Like right now I'm speaking to you, but I feel like the... Like I have to translate sometimes, you know, it's, it doesn't, oh, yeah. yeah, it doesn't well, come. Well, even in. I find if I don't work in French for a week and then I come back and play in French, it's weird. my huh? brain and I just feel so anglophone. I'm just like, oh my, but then there's other times where I'm here for like two weeks yeah. and I feel French and I'm dreaming in French. Exactly. But uh, like you said, once you leave it, it, it it's like, it's gone. It's I mean, gone. I, I, but I, I would think living in Montreal, you can kind of do French and English kind of yes. all the time, but you find you don't speak a lot of English but, in Montreal. <laughs> Well, not anymore. Mm. Like when I was at Mc, well, 15 years ago when I was at McGill, I would speak English a lot. And when I first started stand up and I would do stand up in French and once in a while stand up in English, I would speak English more often. Me, Now I feel like my career is in French. Everything I do is in French. So I don't speak English as much, you know. I watch TV in English, though, but I just oh, listen, you know, I'm not talking back to them. So. Well, I'm interested in that side of your career too because you I, th I if I'm remembering right around 2007 was when you were like living in Toronto and at Second City and you know for people yeah. who don't know you you've had a, a career as an actress as a comedian you've, you've done so many different things but I'm curious if like when did you make a choice to really focus on French because it seemed like maybe your career was going in the direction of being an English comedian um I, it's it's like it's around 2010 maybe that I lived in Toronto 2000 yeah 2009 I was in Chicago but like my father's an actor okay let's start mm. from the beginning he's yes. an actor <laughs> and I always wanted to be an actress he's a he's a famous at well famous he does like a bunch of voices in the Simpsons so he's somehow oh really yeah my father's the famous uh, French Canadian actor and so I always wanted to do to, to be an actress and I don't know. I like studied theater when I was in Cégep. And um, then I auditioned to go to like the National uh, School of Theater in Montreal. And mm. genre, I was refused uh, genre, everywhere. Mm. And But I still wanted to um, go to college. So I went to McGill and languages were always something that I, I was interested in. So I was like, I'm just going to study at McGill and see. Uh, and then when I was at McGill, I was watching Saturday Night Live a lot. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I could, I mm. could, you know, go to Second City and do whatever Tina Fey did because I was just like so in awe of mm. her. And how old were you at McGill? Like 21. Okay. Like I graduated when I was 21, 22. Mm. And right after McGill, I went to Lucam for a year. And then I was like, okay, let's. And I was doing improv a lot back then as well, like a lot of uh, professional improv shows in Montreal. 
and I wasn't stressed anymore. I wasn't like, I was just, oh, let's, let's just do a show. And mm. I was like, what's the next tr stressful thing to do? And I was like, oh, let's try to do improv in English. Because back then I would speak English all the time. My life mm. was almost in English. I, I studied French lit at McGill, but most of my friends spoke English only or so. And so I went to Chicago at Second City for three months and I did an um, um, internship there, like improv for actors class, mm. it was called. And then I really liked it, but it like I needed a green card to stay for longer. So I went to Second City in Toronto afterwards. And there I took a stand-up class. But it was never like because I wanted a career in stand-up. It was mm. just because... I was curious to see, like, I don't know. I just wanted to try stuff that would, like, terrify me. Well, it's neat how your brain works, even that you're like, well, what's the next terrifying yeah, thing I can exactly. do? I think I'll work in English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's that's it. I was like, what's the most terrifying no, thing Not I everyone do? acts that way in their life, you know? But that's, inter that's yeah, an interesting part of your personality. So. I, guess, I, I guess it's because I get tired of stuff easily, mm. you know? Like, once I've tried something, I'm like, okay, genre, what's next, you know? And so, yeah, so I came, ba I came back to French because I could see, like, English is a second language. I'll never be as witty, as quick. I'll never be, like, you know, you know, sometimes you have a great idea, but the words you choose to express it are so important. And mm. I have all the tools in French, but I don't mm. have them in English. So mm -hmm. sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And sometimes, it, like, sometimes oh, it's cute. Uh, she, like, she's funny in English. But no, I lack the tools. So, you know, it was fun. It was a fun experience. I enjoyed doing stand-up in English. I enjoyed doing improv. But, like, when I came back to Montreal afterwards uh, and I started doing stand-up in French, I was like, okay, Jean, mm. this is how it's supposed to feel. <laughs> like, I feel like I have access to all the tools in my toolbox, you know? Mm. And I, if someone heckles, I'm like, hey, Jean, good luck. Yeah. When someone heckles in English, I'm like, oh, please keep talking and go. <laughs> like, I don't, I, yeah. I but, don't know but how as to get back as you to say them. that, you did, didn't you go to Edinburgh, like, five yes, years yes, in a yes. row in English? Three years, three years. Three years. Three years. Yes. Yeah, because that's pretty, yeah. it doesn't sound like you just sort of dipped your toe in there. You threw yourself full in with yeah. was it the same I know you did a show a I, sad joke yeah it was uh, a, a sad joke life. about life I st the three sh it was three different shows mm. but uh no it was three different shows they were all work in progress and they all kind of the first two shows became whispers in the cos well, like the, the Brinant Cosmos my mm. first uh, my first show so the first two uh, Edinburgh runs were like became my third show you know mm. they but again I went just for the experience of it mm. like I went the first time I went I was like I didn't even have a show I went just to see Stuart Lee because he's my favorite comic and so I went and then I had friends that had shows at the fringe mm -hmm. and I was like maybe I can maybe I, I could get in the free fringe you know so so the well, next such year, an amazing place. Like when you're there, it's like, it's how amazing. can I get in this? Yeah, because you've been to. Yeah, one. I went once, and it yeah. was it was the best and the worst exactly. of times. Exactly, because as you know, you do your show twenty five <laughs> days in a row, and you go from loving your show to hating your show and watching people fall asleep in the audience. Exactly, it's like, insane. It's it's the best and the worst thing mm. at the same time. And I don't know, like every time I did it, I was like, this is the last time I'm doing it. And for yeah. some reason I went back. Yeah. And I feel like that's how everyone feels about the fringe, you know, where like it's it's just the atmosphere, the city. Like there's nothing like that. There's nothing like the mm. this festival. And but I didn't go to I feel like I went for the experience of it, you know. But and that's I, cool that you developed your show. You said but basically those three shows led to your yeah. Cosmo show that you did in but 2018. The, I was doing I was doing it in uh, French too cuz I for uh, for 5 years we had a, a, a festival here that was called uh, Le Docteur Mobilo Aquafest which is the mm. alternate comedy festival we started uh, 7 years ago. Mm. And that's where I did like it was we wanted to promote artists that had like they were working on their shows and without like the whole structure of like just for laughs or zoo fest we really wanted them to present something like that was li like a little bit out of the box maybe or mm. something like that and this was a french festival we yeah. we, we and um 
And yeah, so I presented this out like those two hours, and then I was like, maybe I could do them in English too. And it was like I I feel like the comedy I do in French is easily adaptable in English as well. Mm. I don't have like so many Quebecois references either, or, so I just translated them and went to the fringe. But then. Yeah, I guess it was just to be part of the festival. It wasn't like, mm. oh, I, I want to have a career and find an agent or whatever. It was mm. just basically to challenge uh, myself and mm -hmm. then mostly to just be there and go see shows and like open my mind to like new ways of doing stand up, I guess, or, mm. you know. Well, seeing. The show, and I want to say it right, uh, Bruit dans le cosmos. Oui, du bruit dans le cosmos, oui. C'était vraiment cool de voir ça. Oh, well, I'm speaking <laughs> French. Oh, look at me. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm going to speak English. Yeah. But um, it was, I did wonder how some of those jokes developed. And, you know, I wonder even the joke about, uh, it was funny because in watching you, I feel like if Hannah Gatsby, Sarah Silverman, and George Carlin were to have a threesome, they would have had you as well, a child. Thank you so much. That's that's a weird threesome, but I'm so but happy I'm their child. <laughs> just the way Hannah Gatsby kind of like push, like she she dissects the joke. Yeah. And then Sarah Silverman, well, how she pushes the, the, the yeah. edge, right? Where you think she's going one way and then she goes the other way. And then George Carlin also, I love his way, which I think you do a bit of this too, where you're not afraid to sit in the uncomfortableness between you know yeah is the audience uncomfortable they're not laughing right now and yeah. playing with that like i i i'm so curious because it, it's really present in the the show that's on ectv and right. also even the monologue that you did and i want to know how did just if you can talk a little bit about the actual show when you were performing it and working it yeah. to getting it on tv and doing it as a full-blown production can you talk? I was fascinated to know how did it come about? Did you have a director? Did you have writers? Was it really mostly on your own? No, I didn't have like uh, my shows I write by myself. Uh, the, this first show I had help uh, Bruno Cosmos. Christmas. M my ex-boyfriend was also a, a comedian. And so so we like we brainstormed so much that I like I feel like we wrote the show together. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bruno Cosmos, it's weird because when I first started stand up, um, my favorite comic, and I'm almost ashamed to say it, but that was like 13 years ago. I really liked Anthony Jeselnik, and oh, I yeah. can't believe I'm saying this because now I don't like. I understand why I liked him because he was like edgy, and I like I didn't really know stand up. I was never like into stand up. I real like I never even wanted to do stand like become a stand up comic. Like mm. it just happened because I was like I'm curious to see if like I was just. It was. It looks scary, and I wanted to try, and mm -hmm. then I it happened. I think some so, actresses like that was my journey too. With it. Yeah. Like I always went to acting school. I tried stand up because it's just a quick way to get on stage too yeah. and challenging. It was. It's also because I thought stand up wasn't fun. like I thought comics weren't funny. You know, I was mm. like, I was an improviser. <laughs> I was like, we're way better because we improvise. We have n like. We don't even know what we're going to do. Mm. And then it's good. And then I was like, stand-up comics, they have so much time to think about what they're going to say. Mm. But then s when I started stand-up, I realized it's way more, um, like, uh, vulnerabilizing. Like, mm. you're more vulnerable because mm. you don't, like, the, the audience won't forgive. You had time to think about your jokes. You had time to prepare. When you do improv, it's like a happening. Everyone, like... People forgive like you do like a you like one little sketch is not as good as the rest of them. Mm. It's fine. Like it's improv. We forgive. But when it's stand up, it's like, well, I think a lot of people don't know the craft behind yeah, stand up. And exactly. I, I know I used to look at it and think it was like such a lowbrow type of Same. You know, even even Steve Martin, I'm I'm embarrassed to say for years, I was like, he's so fake. Yeah, exactly. But then when but you then, get in it and you try to do it, you see how difficult it is. Yeah. So now I respect stand up. Like I respect comedy from everyone even if i don't like their comedy i like i respect the fact that they they do it you know mm. but anthony jeselnik ugh, i can't like i really liked him during the roast i was like oh he's so edgy and i thought that yeah. was comedy so when i first started i would i would mimic what he did you know like mm. just write i would write one-liners and so when i did um there was a contest on tv here it's called uh, en route vers mon premier gala mm -hmm, just pour mm -hmm. rire 
and it's basically like last comic standing and i was like okay let's let's try last comic standing en route vers mon premier gala just pour rire and back then i would write edgy one liners and i felt like okay i'm a comic i write edgy one liners <laughs> and then i won and so that's when i became a, like a comic for some reason and uh, and then i started get like it, I was more interested into comedy and I started watching different stuff and I like I started watching what Stuart Lee did or Bridget Christie or Daniel mm. Kitson. I got really into like British comics. Mm. And then, and they I was like, oh mon dieu, this is this is so much better than <laughs> Then <laughs> Anthony just like now like, do you not you don't like <laughs> Anthony as much? It's not that I don't like him. I like I'm thankful because he taught me how to write a joke. Basically, mm. it's like joke writing 101. It's like here's a situation, but there's an information you don't know about that situation. And when I release that information, mm -hmm. you're gonna laugh because my uncle's a pedophile, and exactly. we're all laughing. And so, <laughs> well, and he's such a roast comic, yeah. right? Like I think that's how he started working too. He I, would write roasts, yeah. and then they said, "Well, he's good looking, so we'll get him on stage too." <laughs> Even though I find his stage presence, like he doesn't have a really dynamic stage no. presence, but his writing is so strong. Exactly, it doesn't matter. Which I kind of like because I like when comics don't put too much effort in their physicality like i like when mm. i don't know when just the jokes are good and you don't have to be like and like make funny faces mm. and i kind of like that from him but then once you've heard like 10 anthony just only jokes you can tell like you're not surprised by any of his jokes anymore sorry mm. me <laughs> it's i feel like it's such good joke writing mm. you have like the structure of a joke and then you can I don't know. I feel like it's always the same thing, but it taught me how to write a joke and then you can play with the structure. And then when I first started watching uh, Stuart Lee's shows, I was like, okay, Jean, he doesn't really care about the, well, he cares about the joke writing, but he goes, I don't know, like his brain was very impressive to me because I wouldn't, mm. I couldn't tell where he was going before he went there. You know, mm -hmm. he brought me to places I couldn't go by myself. Mm. And so it made my it made my writing evolve, I guess. And at the same time, I was gaining more confidence on stage because it takes I feel like it takes some kind of experience and confidence to to know like people are going to be uncomfortable for a while. But, mm. you know, when where you're leading them to. And when I first started, I was relying on um, on one liners because you get the laugh that you need to to be confident like mm -hmm. every 15 seconds you get a laugh so you're like okay oh, yeah, i have this mm -hmm. cushion and i can sit on and i'm comfortable because i'm good mm -hmm. at what i'm doing right now people are laughing so i guess now that i have more experience i'm not as um i don't care if people aren't laughing for a minute or mm -hmm. a minute and a half mm -hmm. because i know where i'm taking them to you know well i saw that gala you did and i don't know if this was the 2013 one of it was later where you talk about kids in orphanages and the oh, decision we, the, the that the audience yeah. has made to instead of giving yeah. you a charity they've come here to <laughs> laugh and it's like yeah you're you're basically you know stabbing them while making them laugh you know what i mean yeah. like that's what's really cool about your you know the saying the idea of like a, a sting yeah and i feel that's when i was first uh discovering how to do this you know like mm. it's that that's the just for laughs gala where there was like a switch in what i wanted to do mm. uh, comedy wise mm. and even the bruit dans le cosmos like i I'm super, it's my first show. It's my first tour. I did a tour with Mariana Madza first. Like mm -hmm. with, my first tour was a double, uh, how do you say? Genre? Yeah, it was almost like a 30, 30. Yeah, that you we both did 45, 45. Yeah, and, and I was like, it was a good experience and it taught me what tour life was. But then my first show is the Brunel Cosmos. And I'm super proud of this show, but I feel like it was a, uh, I was just starting to understand what I really wanted to do in, in comedy, which is, mm. yes, have like some more like social commentary and yes, have like even like a, a philosophical uh, thoughts sometimes and turn them into jokes. Maybe. So I feel like it's not as well. It's good. I'm super proud of the show, but like. This this show I'm touring with, I feel, is the evolution of the Dubrina yeah. Cosmos. Yeah, well, I want to ask you about that, too. But seeing Puri Dona oui. Cosmos, even seeing that you did 20 minutes on 
co- the cosmos. Yeah. And then you yeah. mo- you yeah. moved into talking about aliens yeah. and death. Yeah. Which again, like wa- watching it, I thought it, it's amazing the the line that you tow in that. And was that like, did how did you work that show? Did you go on tour and work those jokes, yeah, or were I you do. working in bars? Or well, th- you know how it works in the f- on the French side of things. Usually, you like I signed with Just for Laughs years ago for two shows, and then you like. I started writing this show and then you have the rodage period, Mm. like the test runs where I did 40 dates that were test runs, you know, 40 shows. Again, small theaters across Quebec? Smaller, smaller, but sometimes they're not even that small. Like sometimes like, I like playing in front of 300, 350 people. I Mm. feel like that's a good gauge. Sometimes it's more, but rodage is like, Sometimes I would be at Théâtre Sainte Catherine with like 150 people, but sometimes I would be in Laval in front of 300 people. It's mm. just they call it rodage, so they can sell the tickets cheaper, but still make money before the right. tour actually works. And it's works. considered like rodage means practice, it, right? Yeah, or it it's means like, like testing. Test. Yeah, exactly. Testing. So, so you did that know, for like two years? No, or? no, for like for a few months. A few maybe, months, okay. Yeah. And then uh, and then the show comes like. And then you're like, okay, we have a show. Mm. And then the the lights and decor come in. And mm. I didn't have a stage director. I just did everything uh, myself. Sometimes I feel like in comedy, like sometimes the uh, Quebecois, French Quebecois stand up, puts a lot of money in like mm. stage directing, lights, decor. And I'm like, why would I spend so much money? Mm. Well, it's a huge industry. It's like a, the, it yeah. is... I keep saying it's like a Hollywood, but it seems exactly. like you've decided not to necessarily like, go it's just that, I that don't direction. Wanna, I did want to put so much money in my show before we even sell it because, mm. like, I know my comedy is a little genre niche. I don't know. Like, I'm not going to sell 100,000 tickets, you know? So I don't want to put money in my show that I. Then I need to do a hun- like 400 shows to make money with my show. I was like, I'm just going to, you know, do my little thing and hopefully people show up. Thank you. And when, when you say it's niche, Man. do you, it, has it been decided that your comedy is niche or do yeah, you well, just think it's, just, it's niche? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's niche because it's my niche. So yeah, I feel like this like is you what's found, funny. And you found your public. Yes, like exactly. Like watching you, I think it's kind of like, I always love the idea of, in comedy where you've got like the punk rock com- comedian yeah. or you've got the rock and roll yeah. comedian or you know the more the country singer i, yeah. I think like i think that's why like, i said the threesome of carlin we, and <laughs> silver is because i think what you're doing is very original too and it's merci so much but it's not that it's like i wouldn't call it niche but it's just that people when people talk to me about my comedy i like they use um words that like oh it's a uh, Engage, like poli- it's more political. It's mm-hmm. like they use words that aren't um, super uh, popular uh, <laughs> in the comedy industry, you know. Mm. Like, mm. but I feel like I found my public really too. It just took time because the Brillant Cosmos, the first tour, I did 125, 30 shows across uh, Quebec. It went well, but sometimes, sometimes I was like, "This is hard." People like, is it? Like, is it me? Am I the problem? Like, people, sometimes the reception was like, I don't know, people weren't laughing that much. But then they, after the show, they were like, oh, we really enjoyed ourselves. Mm. Well, I've always wondered about that with Rodage. Like, if people are paying to come, but you're not getting reviewed and you're working on new jokes, like, are you actually working on new jokes? And sometimes, because what do you do if it, the jokes don't go well. Like I even find rodage can be challenging because if people love you already, like even in, in Quebec, I've gotten yeah. into in Montreal where you can go and do new material in different uh-huh. rooms, but sometimes you're going back for a third time and they're like, oh my God, we love Rochelle. And then you're going to try to work on new material, but you blew them away last time with stuff that was worked out a bit. So yeah. it's, it's kind of a tricky balance. And I imagine when you're there's money behind you to go and work new material in areas there i'm sure there were challenges at times yes there there were you wonder like is this good or not or but the thing is sometimes like i know a lot of comics like if it doesn't work they will get rid of the joke Mm. but i'm like i don't know the word oh yeah 
And I'm like, I don't care. I'm keeping yeah. this joke for me. You don't want to kill and your baby. Like three people, <laughs> yeah, three people are gonna find it funny, mm. and I'm doing it for these three people. Mm. And one of these people is me, you mm-hmm. know. So, but but the radage, you know, the thing is, the people don't come back to see the, sh- you know, it's different people all the time. Mm. So I like I didn't. You're touring. And then some people that are hard- hardcore fans are going to come see the radage and mm-hmm. then they're going to come back for the actual show. Mm-hmm. And I always feel like my shows, like they have evolved in radage. Like I get used to doing them, so I'm more comfortable in them. So sometimes you know how it is. Like sometimes you write jokes on stage because the energy of the crowd is good and you're, you feel comfortable and mm-hmm. you're in a bit you've done like 12 times. But for some reason... You, f- I don't know, like f- to me, like sometimes I'm in the zone, you know, so I'm doing like I'm just doing the same bit. But then the people, the energy is so like ça voyage mm. so well mm-hmm. that you write new jokes from the top of your head oh, and then yeah. you keep them. So the radage basically, that's that's what it's for, you know, it's mm. just I I wasn't writing that many more jokes. You know, the show was written when I started the radage oh, because was? I okay. had because I had tested it in separate little uh, sets, you mm-hmm. know, at Le Bordel or mm-hmm. Le Terminal. Or, so it was like I tested 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes here and there. And it was two years of like 15 minutes here and there. And then six months of like putting the show together mm. and then doing this show like an hour and a half and then becoming comfortable in doing it. And then adding little jokes and fighting little, finding little links between bits, you know, because sometimes you have like four different 15 minutes mm-hmm. and you're like, I'm good. This is my hour. But then b- building the bridges but be- between them is feels unnatural. I don't know if like, mm. like the transitions between the, yeah, the transitions are like, well, how am I going to segue from like aliens to money? You know, like, <laughs> okay. So. And you didn't bring in directors or did you have like, at the time you said your boyfriend had helped yeah. you a lot. Would he come in and see like a show and take notes? They, or? He came to see the show a few times, but it was mostly like smoking weed and walking around the living room. <laughs> <laughs> was, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And we would just like it, smoke weed and walk in the backyard and be like, okay, hey, what can we like, do with this? this is it. Yeah. And do you write your jokes on paper? Do you tend to write them out? Do you record yes, your I sets write and listen? I write everything. Mm. Like some comics are just like, a, like they don't write. I I feel mm-hmm. like they, I write everything. I'm always scared I'm going to forget something. Mm. And usually, like... So you write and memorize, and then you, yes. you present it. Yes. Like, even the other day when I saw you, when we were at Guillaume Old yes. Oaks Night, had you written those jokes? Yes, or those jokes you had written. done before? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't remember what I did there, but, like, I guess I did a few a few jokes that aren't in my tour right now because okay. I'm, I'm touring with a show, but now that the show is written and I'm just touring with it, I really like uh, like still writing on the side just mm-hmm. so because there's probably going to be a third show anyways mm. so i like to be ready and keep you know i don't know my brain uh, active and creative so so but it's all written in my computer it's all written even like categories I, yeah or? i have like a folder for like tested in bars uh, tested mm. at le bordel it's a mess, but still I feel organized. So <laughs> I wish I could be more organized. Like I often have like just these pads of paper in there everywhere. But it's so you have little written. sections yes. in your computer yes. and written Wait, out. By years too. Like okay. I, and sometimes I'm like, okay, let's write some new jokes. But I still open my folder that's called like new ideas. And mm. most of the time they're ideas I haven't used yet. So mm. and in my phone also I record like sometimes I'm just walking on the street. Or even, I run a lot. So when I'm running, I'm like, okay, I have an idea. And mm. I'm like, okay, it's just like maybe. <laughs> so I have so many uh, voice notes in my cell phone. And are you structured? Like are you uh, like every day at nine or it's whenever it kind of like strikes you, you want? I am not, but I had to be for the second tour of this show, the Mes Sentiments that I'm touring right now, last summer for a month and a half. Every day I woke mm. up at like seven, mm. went to the cafe at eight, left by noon. And that's how I wrote the show. It was mm. the first time I would work like that. Because I had no choice because anyways, the test runs were booked, like the test shows were booked. And I was like, I don't have a show. Mm. I have I have half an hour written. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't have a show. So I like I had a month and a half off and every day. Like I had never worked like that. I usually I'm just like uh, creativity mm. happens when it happens, you know? Like So had that because you 
you have written Mon- Mes Sentiments, and that came out uh, in, in March. In March, okay, yeah, so, so very last recently. Summer, this is the summer before. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. what what did you learn from Cosmos? When you look at Mes Sentiments now, what you've done in your process, I mean, you said you were sort of yeah. forced into writing every yeah. day, but what what have you learned between these two shows? Because there wasn't even that much time. I guess it was like 2018 and yeah, 2022. Yeah, like 2018, and I toured until like 2020. And then I had seven shows left on my tour when the pandemic happened, and mm. I did maybe like three of them when it kind of reopened, and then I was like, let's cancel. I want to... I'm done with Bruno Christmas. Mm. I want to do another show. But then it like we could do shows, we couldn't. We could do shows, we couldn't. Mm. So I was like kind of writing, kind of not, kind of writing. Went to the bordel sometimes. So I had like 20, 25 minutes of new material that I didn't know when it was going to become a show. And then everything reopened and Just for Laughs was like, okay, so like we need to book, like because they need to book the venues like years (laughs) ahead, you know. I was like, well, I keep book them, but I don't know if I'm going to have a show. <laughs> and so, so I guess I don't, I, I, I don't have like a tangible thing I l- learned, but I feel it's just the experience, you know? And also doing a second tour, I feel like the people who came to see the first show and liked it are coming back. So I feel like the audience is like, people now kind of know what they're into mm-hmm. when they come see my mm-hmm. show, which is... But also at the same time, I feel like my second show, Mes Sentiments, is a little more accessible, you know, it, because I feel like Zbrun on Cosmos, it was funny, but I feel like I didn't really understand how, well, there are jokes, it's still funny, but I didn't understand how to make something really n- not funny, f- funny. Mm. I, sometimes I could, you know, I, but I feel like Mes Sentiments, I'm a little closer to being able to, to take an idea that's uh, not really funny and make it funny. I feel like it's just the experience. Well, and I almost wondered if it was more personal too, because even looking at like the cosmos, from seeing cosmos and then seeing even your trailer from A Sentiment, what I almost predict, because cosmos was very much the the thoughts you have yeah. and where your brain is and what you think about. Yeah. But then the second show is Mes Sentiments. I know it's not your second show, but second French show. Yeah, yeah. Mes Sentiments. And at the end, you're cry- you know, you're starting out really like trying to be high status about your show and then you're crying and calling your mom. Yeah. It seemed like maybe this is uh you getting even deeper into yourself. I mean, what a lot of people don't know about you too, though, is that yes, you've done these two one woman shows, but you're also like You've been on SNL Quebec. Yes. <laughs> You've done improv with Punch Club and other major yeah. shows. You you do serious uh, acting. Yeah. You've been you've done so many things. So it's almost like some people could think this is just an extra that you do that you happen to be having great success at. But it it must be pretty amazing that you can actually like you know you're at Club Soli and then you're you're yeah. working on your show. Bang. But st- like, do you ever feel? I imagine with you even last year having to write and like really sit down, was that partially because you're so busy with all these other acting things? Yes. Like Because stand up, as you know, like there are people right now all week they've been out doing stand up and it's just that machine of getting your voice and I working know. on it every night. You're getting better and stronger. And I, I imagine you don't have that luxury. But I sometimes do. Like I, I try to balance the, like usually like the months I'm doing stand up, I'm I'm like okay for six months I'm I'm a comedian now you mm. know I I try to compartimenter like to separate mm-hmm. like so when I'm an actress I'm an actress and I try to just act and mm. sometimes I will have like sometimes I will have to go to le bordel or I will have to do a show but I always try to genre split these in two different categories because. But I'm I'm also like I'm super lucky because I get to do stand up and I get to act which is. So, and I never get tired of either of those, you know, because mm-hmm. I, I said I'm, I get, I, I'm easily bored. Yes. And then because I do both and not at the same time, I, I never get bored of one another. But mm. when I had to write, it's because I had such a big like acting year that I wasn't a comedian for a while. And I was like, I need to. And I cr- like for real, I was crying on the phone. I was like, I don't like 
I was like such a diva. I was like, I don't, nobody, nobody calls me. I don't want to talk about the, like the producing my, sh like just for laughs, had questions, or, like block the question. Like I was yes, on the phone with my agent. I was on like, your can comedy. you just let me write? Cause I can't tell you anything about like when or where I want to do my show or my premiere. I, it, I don't have a show. So just like, let me write a show. And mm. then, so it was, I was being an actress because yes. I had to be a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> I was like such a, but then, yeah, but then I had the mental space to write and then I had the mental space to become an actress again. And then mm. I had the mental space to, but when my premiere happened in March, I was happy to show the test runs were going well because I was shooting a movie at the same time. Oh, the Christmas Yeah, the Christmas movie. movie. So, so I was super stressed last summer, but then everything fell back into place. Mm. And yes, sometimes... I'd like to have time to be just a, co a comic, you know, go to le bordel all the time. But whenever I have two weeks off, I I go to le bordel mm. and I test stuff. But right now I'm touring with my show and I'm mostly a comedian that is fall. I'm mostly a comedian right now. Well, and that, what's yeah. amazing when you have a show when you're touring theaters. Yeah, it's it's the ideal environment every night where you get to work on your craft. Exactly, yeah. and I feel like my show technically is like it's it's the show, and it doesn't evolve anymore. Me, it's such a it's such a like a living art stand up. It evolves like even when you're done with the test runs. I did my show six times at Le Lion d'Or in the past two weeks. And the girl working the bar was like, I see all the work you did. And I was like, I didn't feel like I was doing any work. I'm just doing the show. Mm. But it, because you're doing it six times in a row mm. in front of different people, it evolves. Even if you're not like, I don't. And was she someone who had seen it several times? Well, she's so seen she was it seeing six times. Oh, yeah, okay. So she's seen she it develop. Yeah, she was working yeah. the bar. Yeah. So she was like, I see the work you did. And I was like. I wasn't really working. Like, this is not a test run by the way, madame. Yeah. It's, this is the show. But, like, I didn't realize that mm. the more the more you do it, the more it, it, it evolves, you know? Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's ever-changing. It's always evolving. Oh, yeah. You know? And it's always, you're always getting better and better. Yeah. And always it, it's always a challenge. And I want to jump back, like, kind of way back oui. to even before you knew you want. I mean, you said your dad was oui, an actor oui. and I'm curious about like your childhood and even growing up you know when I look back I, I I didn't even realize when I was watching I Love Lucy and Carol Burnett that that was what I would end up really oui. wanting to be oui. but when you look back in your life and I'm sure you've had time to reflect on it too what were you consuming as a kid were you also a kid that made people laugh like what was your childhood yeah. like as someone who's now become an actress become a comedian can you kind of dissect it a bit and see yeah. how it is that you even ended up where you are? But I, I feel like I'm this, it's weird because I feel like, like a lot of people, like people say they change and they evolve. And a lot of my friends are like, oh, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. And I'm like, I'm the exact same person I was 30 years ago. Oh, really? Like, I feel like I've always been, um, yeah, except like I'm an adult, but like, I've always been the, the uh, playful kid. I had like a, I had a camera and like I had a little studio in the basement with a, and I've played the piano my whole life. And I have a very artistic family that was always um, super um, open about like performing arts. And I know a lot of people were like, oh, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer. And I have a, my dad's an example of someone who succeeded in doing like, a, mm. I don't know, genre more uh, champ gauche, uh, a career like he's an actor I feel and what like voices did he do on the Simpsons he does Ned Flanders and Chief Wiggum oh my god and, uh, I love joy he does I, I uh, researched your career but I didn't find yeah. all that stuff out <laughs> holy cow yeah, yeah. Ned and Flanders my, oh yeah he's and then Ned Flanders. and how about your mom what is and, her career path? I know my mom she used to be uh, she was working for Bell Canada when my dad was like a struggling actor and then he like he started working and then got the Simpsons gig and he started doing a lot of uh, TV. Thank you so much. So my mom, uh, after my, I have a younger sister. After she was born, uh, my mom quit, like never um, went back to work after her uh, uh, maternity leave. Mm. She she was just like, I'm going to take care of the three kids at home. Mm. And my dad had a successful uh, acting career doing a, a lot of voices. Like he's, it's funny because a lot of people know my dad's voice. 
because they hear it like he he dubbed a, he dubbed Tom Hanks Tom Hanks in many of his movies most oh, of wow. okay. most of the French versions I I can't watch even growing up when I could barely speak English I would watch the movies in English because half of the time if I watched them in French my dad's voice was You're on there kidding. Yeah. so he played Forrest Gump yeah. in French uh, no, no you know what that that's the, the only the one exception he didn't do, he did Philadelphia but he didn't do Forrest oh, Gump shit. so is he gonna do the new Elvis oh is he oh pr maybe I, yeah that was Tom Hanks uh, well now right brand now new. he's back to doing Tom Hanks I he's probably doing Tom Hanks in that movie too yeah that is insane. Uh, he did Woody Harrelson for a few movies too like Larry Flint I remember he dubbed uh, that's Woody hilarious Harrelson. that pushed you into English because you're like I don't need yeah, to hear yeah, my dad yeah. in that movie <laughs> <laughs> so and other than that yeah I was I learned English watching TV basically like I did well we do have English classes in school but I was always um I really wanted to speak English you know a lot of my friends they do speak English but they they would never watch TV in English I watched like I learned English watching Dawson's Creek and uh, the Maury show even I would watch the Maury show and I I watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer that's what I would I was watching growing up did you watch any comedy as a kid or like even as a family, did you guys watch? Like you said, SNL. You yeah, got I watched into. SNL when I was a little older. May, uh, yeah, but I would watch um, like La Petite Vie, which is genre staple comedy. Oh yeah, absolutely. my dad wasn't into, but that I he did. wasn't into it. He was he wasn't. Yeah, he was playing in La Petite Oh, he was in it. He was okay. In then it. you said he yeah, wasn't no, no, into he it. Was oh, of course, in, he was in yeah, that. That's was amazing. In okay, your dad's super famous. Uh, yeah, well, not <laughs> super. Well, the thing is. When I was in high school, everyone was like, oh, you're Bernard Fontaine's daughter. And I was like, I didn't want people to know who my dad was because back then he was super famous and I didn't want to be Bernard Fontaine's daughter all mm -hmm. the time. I wanted to be Virginie. And when I was younger, I would tell my dad, I was like, one day you're going to be Bernard Fontaine's, uh, you're going to be Virginie Fontaine's father, you know that? And I kept telling him, one day you're going to be Virginie Fontaine's father. And like for the past three years, every time my dad is on a, a TV set, he's like, okay, I'm definitely, uh, <laughs> I'm definitely Virginie Fontaine's father because everyone's talking to me about you. Oh, I'm like, okay, that's awesome. Finally, Papa. Yay. Finally. <laughs> Have you guys worked together? Uh, yes, a little bit. But when I first started, I really didn't want people, like I didn't want to be Bernard Fontaine's daughter. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be Virginie Fontaine. But now that I have that I'm comfortable in my uh, own uh, career like we've we've done a few things together and actually uh, tonight's episode of Club Soli oh my dad I thought wait for it he's playing my boyfriend oh! <laughs> which is disgusting <laughs> <laughs> but yeah tonight in Club whose Soli. idea was that Arnaud Soli oh idea. <laughs> okay what a bastard <laughs> yeah. I was like That's okay awkward. I'm comfortable if my yeah it's super awkward but was it fun it was to work so together yeah. yeah it was so much fun yeah yeah I, I and I've worked with him the first time I did uh uh, I was I, on stage. Uh, we did a, a summer uh, theater play. You know, sometimes they have a. I don't know if it's in the culture uh, in the rest in the English uh, can Canada and Quebec, but in France, there's something called Théâtre d'été, which mm -hmm. is it's like theater during oh, the summer. summer. Theater, like yeah, kind summer of, yes, theater, in a park, so it's always outdoors. No, it's indoors, but it's okay. super light. It's always light. It's always like doors that are opening and, oh, my wife is cheating, you know? And okay. they, it's like super, like comedy, yeah. like where people get in trouble, you know? Yeah, it's, almost like it's a little super bit cheesy light. and yeah, light. Exactly. Okay. Is it am amateur theater? No, it's professional. Oh, it's professional. Though. It's okay. super professional, okay. but it's just like a little, like... It's more like, oh no, what are we going to do with this? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, this is tellement réducteur. But um, so I did a play when I was 16, 17 years old with my dad. And that's the first time we worked together. And mm. that was professional, but still summer theater. And um, and then, yeah, he, we did a sketch. We did a few sketches together, but nothing like, uh, never like something like a big contract. Maybe one day. Maybe one day he'll play my dad on a TV. And your two siblings, did any of them go into the arts? Oh, no, my brother is a computer. <laughs> <laughs> he is a computer. <laughs> he is. <laughs> <laughs> he's, it's a compliment. He's just, um, babe, right now he's, yeah, because he's, he's a computer. I can't believe I said he's a computer, but he's just <laughs> super smart, super rational. Now he, he owns a, a gym, but he used to be into programming and stuff like mm. that. And my sister, she works in television. She does a lot of improv too, but she does um, 
as, as the, the um, clothes on TV sets. Mm. She's working on Occupation Double right oh, now. Okay. She's in Martinique, dressing up the, the, the people. Yeah, she works in um, fashion for okay. TV. Yeah. So I'm, I imagine, like my family was like this too, that there was never any judgment about yeah. going into the arts, which I'm sure that exactly. that's, you already mentioned yeah. that. So what has been your sort of journey into becoming a comedian and accepting that? Was that always easy for you? Like, it sounds like you kind of wandered a bit in, yeah. what am I going to do? Am I going to do improv? Am I going to do comedy? But can you talk about a time maybe where things weren't clicking or weren't working yeah. or where you, what you've, what, what you've struggled with maybe over your career? Yeah. The, when, cause I wanted to be an actress and then, and then it didn't work with the acting schools, so I went to college. And then when I was 23, 24, I was like, okay, maybe maybe my dream's not going to come true, and it's fine because I really enjoyed, like, I wanted to teach at some point. And I remember I was a waitress at the Bell Center for, for years, This like, and I was like, oh, I, I really like working at the Bell Center in the private suites. It's nice. Mm -hmm. And then I like had like little jobs. I would work for my, my uncle had the company. He he worked with golf clubs anyway. So I, like people in my family would hire me because of uh, it's not it's unclear what Virginie is doing with her <laughs> life. You know, she'll try it. Yeah, and then, and then twenty three, twenty four. They moved to Toronto, moved to Chicago, moved back here. I was like, okay, I do like I do a little bit of improv, but maybe. Maybe this is it. Maybe I'm just gonna work as a waitress, or I can go back to I can go back to school and become a teacher. And and the acting is gonna be with like improv, which I enjoyed. Like so many uh, bars have improv shows, and my friends were all improvisers. I was like, okay, this is maybe where my like uh, I don't know my needs to for attention and like mm. entertainment are gonna this is where they stay, you know? And mm -hmm. so, but I wouldn't say I was struggling. I was, I'm, I was never like, Oh, I have to do this or I'm going to be depressed my whole life. You know, it's, I've always been curious to try stuff. And when it works, I keep going. When it doesn't work, I stop, you know, I just mm. find something else to do. And so that's when I tried stand up, and that's mm. when I started doing Stand, like I did stand up in Toronto and then I moved back to Montreal and then I started doing stand up in French here and it was working well. And then I did, I did the En route vers mon premier gala juste pour rire and I won and I was 26 or 27 and then went on tour and then everything, it just, it started there. When you win that, does that mean I know it, it means, means you do a do gala, it just for laughs gala yes. but does it mean you tour as well? Or but does, the, like, it how doesn't does that work? mean I tour, but it what happened is like we were two uh, uh, women in the final with Mariana Mazza, mm. uh, and she had already signed with a producer, and he was like, Let's do a double header, uh, like the double headliner with you and tour. So they produced mm. our first tour. So after I won, I did my just for laughs gala. We did like six months of uh, rodage, mm -hmm. and then uh, next February we were starting our tour uh, for seventy-five shows. Maybe we did together, mm. and at that time I auditioned for Saturday Night Live uh, Quebec, and because mm -hmm. they saw me on on en route vers mon premier gala juste pour rire, and I kind of knew I had done a few things in television, but nothing meaningful. So, and because I did improv. People kind of knew me, but I like I didn't. I wasn't like pr a professional yet. They would hire me for sometimes for, you know, little gigs. But then I auditioned for SNL and got the part. And has this has changed my life? Oh, that, I'm this sure. This is what like winning en route vers mon premier gala juste pour rire, and being hired on SNL, SNL Quebec, which was a good idea, but too much money, <laughs> like live TV on Télé Québec. Oh, it's live. I didn't quite realize it was officially live. It was live. It was, it was SNL New York approved. Like they came to see our tapings once in a while. And it's a really good show. Yeah. Like I've watched it and laughed a lot. It's, but it's so much, it's, it's like the means they have in the U.S. Because pro there's probably like 4 million people watching SNL in the U.S., which mm -hmm. is nothing 
which is nothing in the like I don't know how many people live in the U.S. but it's but still in the it's, grand scheme of things it's yeah, not that many people it's not that many people but here in Quebec if if the same percentage of people watches your show <laughs> it's Like, it's not a success. Like, it has to be canceled, you know? So mm. there's probably the same ratio of people that was watching SNL. Mm. So But for you, was that a career explosion once you got on that show? Well, it, for for all of us, for all the actors, like, we, were, we weren't working that much. We were all youngsters. And it has changed everyone's career, I feel. Like, mm. it, it did the same that SNL does for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Actors who do SNL, you know, that's where their their career starts. That's where it started for me. It lasted a year and a half or two years. We did a sh one show a month. It was so much fun. And then some sketches were, uh, and some sketches were great. Same <laughs> same thing with the actual SNL. But but that's like a lot of people were watching. Not a lot of people like the public, but a lot of people from the industry were watching. And I feel like it. It did change my mm. life because after that, it's because I was on SNL that um, the writer uh, from Tro, which is a, a, a comedy, well, dramedy I did on Radio Canada, mm -hmm. that's where they saw me and they were like, maybe she could audition for one of the lead roles. And then I auditioned and then got the part. And for three years, I, I was on that TV show. So it's because of SNL. It's because mm. of... So So yeah, basically people say, oh, you're a late bloomer because my career only started like when I was 20, 28, 9, you know, mm. but, but I feel like it, I've always been doing this. It's just that it, I became a more mainstream uh, when I, bef just before I turned 30, you know, mm. Well, and you've done so much TV, so much acting, so mm -hmm. many characters and stand up, and Do you find you can just adjust quite easily? Like, has it changed over the years that you've gotten better at that? Because I wonder if, have you had times where you're not confident because you're, oh, you you yeah. just did your stand-up show and suddenly you're on a show, a TV show, mm -hmm. where you have to do characters with other people? Like, how have you adapted? Because there's such different skills. Yeah, but you probably, like, you do the, you also, like, act and your character, like, you do characters. Well, I do a lot. And the thing do... that I do, though, that's very different from you is I, I did improv for a long time. Yeah. And I remember when I took a course with Philippe Goyer, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's teacher, mm -hmm. he was like, you are a soloist. Like, he pointed oh, really, it out. Yeah? He, and, and I always like the idea of being in a team. Yeah. And I can do team stuff. But I know that really my nature is, is that I'm a soloist. Way. And I, you strike me as someone who does both. a lot of both. And you've done so much improv. Yeah. And you seem like a real kind of team player. Yeah, I, but, but I'm curious about you because you do step into that solo role yeah. very easily too. I guess I like both. But like the pressure of doing solo stuff is sometimes to me it's too much. Like sometimes mm. I can't believe I do stand up. I'm like, why? Like, there's a part of me who's like, I don't want the attention, but please give it to me, you know? <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, improv and acting. The f the thing is, I always wanted to be an actress, but then when I started stand-up, I was like, oh, maybe this whole time I was, a, I was just a comedian and I'm not, like, good at pretending I'm going through emotions, you know? So I kind of thought, oh, you're not an actress. You're just, an improv like, a funny improviser and you do stand-up, you know? And then when I auditioned for the role, I remember, which is like the role, Tro was a, it was a really good comedy, but still with big parts of the drama because I play um, Anaïs, who's a, a girl everyone likes, but then she's diagnosed with, a, um, uh, she's bipolar. Mm. And so it's a, it's a comedy, but it's super touching at the same time. And the morning of the audition, I was like, I can't, I can't. Again, I called my agent. I was like, I don't know why. I was crying on the phone. Why did we say yes? I'm, I am a comedian. I'm not an actress. I don't want to go. And he was like, we can't really cancel. That's unprofessional. I'm like, I, know, I don't want to cancel. I just want to tell you, like, don't put me through this ever again. So, but then I showed up to the audition and I guess I was in the right mood because I was like, I don't know. I was crying, but happy. But, and so, and the audition was so much fun. I got the call back and the call back was amazing. And I was like, okay, maybe I can do this. And the first year of shooting, I felt like out of, like I didn't feel 
I feel like an imp- I felt like an imposter, you know. Mm. I had mm. imposter syndrome, which is I don't know. I feel like everyone has imposter syndrome, but it was really imposter syndrome that first year, and it took me. Yeah, it probably took the first season for me to be like, okay, stop, Virginie. You're you can do this, and you can. Like I did characters at improv. I would, you know. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm an actress now too. So a year of being But in that. What, what, it was so like what do 35 you do? days of. And what kind of stuff do you do for yourself when you are? Are you someone who writes in their journal? Do you meditate? Do you? You said you run. Like how do you? How have you worked through those? times where you're feeling really shitty about yourself Maybe. i mean obviously you have a good agent that you can yeah. call and cry because that seems to really make a big <laughs> difference <laughs> yeah but i changed agents that the, i cried to many agents uh it's my third now but she's the she's the right one um <laughs> but i guess i it was just the people around me who were super i didn't like the people were super reassuring like i knew like the first season we shot the writer was super, like she would watch the rushes and she was like it's so good virginie and the director so everyone around me was telling me jean you're doing a great job and i f- like i feel like i needed people to reassure me that i was doing a, a, a good job and then when the series came out uh, people really liked the show so i f- i guess i was like okay stop jean Uh, being insecure about yourself, stop you know, doubting yourself. People, people seem to think you're good at this. So I kind of needed the people to confirm uh, I was good at this. Mm-hmm. Like I, I wish I could tell you, oh no, I worked on myself, but I really needed the people's opinion. <laughs> And did you watch it too? Or are of you someone I who can watch? It. Yeah, because yes. I know some people are like I can't watch myself on I film or TV. I have trouble watching myself doing stand up sometimes. Mm. But uh, th- I didn't like I watched the show and I was r- like really proud of what we did. The whole show was uh, good to was fun to watch. And I and, you know, you know, some scenes I'm like, okay, not the best, but like people won't notice. I just know. Mm. And some scenes I was like, okay, I was in the zone, you know. And so the second season and the third season, I was like, okay, Virginie, Jean, stop overthinking it. You're an actress. <laughs> And then, but I, some re- so when I'm shooting, like when I'm on set with people, I feel like I'm more insecure because it's the pressure's on a lot of people, but also you want to deliver for the person who wrote it. You want to deliver for the person who's directing it. Mm. You're sharing the pressure, but you don't want to be like the weakest link, you know? Mm. When I'm doing stand up, it's a lot of pressure on my shoulders. But if I fuck up, it's just for like, It's just, I'm just fucking up for me, you know, mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm not, um, it's not this, like, I'm not disappointing to anyone but me and maybe mm-hmm. my parents, but they're always proud. <laughs> so, it, well, and lastly, I want to sort of zone in on that yes. is with, with stand up because I know you said you did two shows last week at Lyon d'Or and you have mm-hmm. a tour coming up and all that. How how are you stepping into that? Like coming out of doing a lot of TV and now stepping into your second show, already thinking about your third show, like where are you at? What's, what, what is even your process of like arriving at the theater? Are you going over notes the day of, are you watching videos? Are you like, I took, I don't even need to anymore. Like I'm usually I'm stressed. I'm like, do I remember my show? But, uh, Especially that I took a break, like a two months break for the summer. I was like, I'm not doing anything this summer. I mm. like the show came out. The premiere was in March. I did, I don't know, like dozens, I don't know, maybe 30 dates. Um, and then I took a break for the summer. And so b- my first show after the summer, like early September, I had to go th- back to my notes. I read my show the, during the day, did my show. And now that I've done it, I feel like it's printed in my brain forever, you know, well, for mm-hmm. the whole year. So I don't like right now my show in my brain is it's in there somewhere. Even if I don't think about it today or tomorrow, I'm on stage. I'm doing it in a few days. I'm not even going to have to think about it. It's just mm. the m- music lights and I walk on stage and it and it just happens. It's printed in my brain right now. Mm. So that's where I'm at with the show. And I'm happy because... But even though it's printed, before every show, I tell Robin, my my director technique, uh, my the, my tour my tour guy. I don't know how he go, he does the lights. <laughs> my <laughs> he tech does the man. Light, yeah, 
And friend, I, I tell Robin, I'm like, I know my show, huh, Robin. I did it last week. He's like, you know your show. That's Vianney. hilarious. You do, yeah. you do, this is something yeah. you ritualistically say to him. Yeah, yeah. I'm always like, I remember my show, huh? And he's always like, where are we, Virginie? I'm like, we're in space. But that's what he would say, like. Cause oh, the first, he was in your first yeah, show, Yeah, he was doing my first show, too. I'm like, so he's like, where are we? I'm like, oh, we're in space. But it, that's the first show, Robin. But we're also in time. <laughs> and the first, mm. the second show starts with a, a long monologue about time. You know, the first one started with a long uh, monologue about space. The second starts with a long monologue about time. Oh, I love yeah. that. Well, and that I think too is my husband's a scientist. So he always, you know, if ever I'm taking myself too seriously, he'll remind me we're just like a speck in of space. dust in yeah. space. Yeah. Is that sort of a little bit of the base of it to that, remind you of just don't get too exactly uh, up on yourself because that really... Exactly. That's what that was the that was the base of the of the Bruit dans le Cosmos, you know, talking about how we're just in space. So why am I stressed? Like what? And the second show, it's the same. Uh, it's the same uh, avenue. Uh, like it just it's mm. the logical uh, suite genre to I, the first I, well, show. I can't wait to see it. And I like it that it's like you're you're a philosopher and a comedian all in one. And it seems like with this one, you're excited about the laughs it's too like kind that, of yeah, getting closer to that it's just that i feel uh, yeah i feel like it's it's less uh, oh it takes a like oh she's not afraid because a lot of people are like oh you're not afraid to just talk for three minutes and then get a laugh and sometimes i was insulted i was like no no i feel like there are jokes <laughs> it's not that i'm not afraid yeah. I, like i feel i thought it was like i thought i was being funny <laughs> but this one i feel like it's the jokes are more punctual like punctual mm. Mm. they're yeah i feel like it's like you're hitting a the, bit harder the deeper stuff lines. is better hidden mm. um under jokes oh, under mm. more jokes you know so. and do you like are, are you still really into British comedians? Yes. Or, yeah. Yes. So who, who's your sort of like same, latest I'm, discovery or the same? Uh, but I have like I've stuck. To, well, I went to see um. Oh mon dieu, what's his name? Uh, redhead. Um, uh, oh mon dieu, sorry, I can't believe uh, I forgot his name. He was at just for laughs this summer. James. Um, uh, voyons. Oh mon dieu, what's his A name? A redhead British oui, comedian oui, with it was red. So good at that. Uh, James uh, A. Caster. Oh, mon Dieu, Seigneur. Oh, okay. James A. Caster. So good. Oh, really? Yes. Very good. Very. Uh, his show was called uh, Heckler's Welcome. And, uh, but to, like, I was surprised because I was like, he's not the kind of comic who would be like, heckle me and I'll rebuttal in the re really and smart And he didn't way. have hecklers in the show? No, it's just that he starts the show saying like he doesn't want to like it's not like oh, heckle me and I'll rebuttal you in a very like witty way. He's just like I was tired of like being disappointed with my crowds where they would like have their cell phones ring and like like he's like I can't spend the rest of my life trying to control you. So like if ever you want to like and he just starts the show, but it's still it's a, it's a written show and it's I don't I don't mm. like. Have you seen his? Uh, he has uh, two I specials on no, Netflix. I haven't. No, I haven't seen yeah. him. No, I'll but check my, him out. My favorite is still uh, Stuart Lee and Bridget Christie and Daniel Kitson. Daniel Kitson is probably my favorite comic. Uh, he's, I know those names, but I realize I'm mm -hmm. I'm much more American influenced. Yeah. But I've often wanted to get more into British comedy. Oh, uh, me, Daniel Kitson to me, he's like the he's the accessible genius. Well, I th I think it's funny being when I'm at Le Baudel or even in like green mm -hmm. rooms talking to comedians in Quebec because yeah. they're always watching American or British comedy. Yeah. And for the last two years, I've been watching French comedy, yeah. Quebec comedy, you probably which know is more. because I want to know. Yeah. I, and, and I might know more than some of the young comedians yes. in Quebec because yeah. I am consuming so much French comedy. Um, anyhow, it was so nice to get a chance we, to talk to we you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry, some sentences I started and never ended because I couldn't, I, I, I didn't have the words. Oh, <laughs> not at all. I'm amazing. You're, you're so bilingual. You've oh, mon Dieu, mais toi aussi. Well, merci. <laughs> je dis toujours, je, je préfère parler en français, mais it was fun oh, to oui, talk hein? English with you merci for an hour. Merci so Thanks. much. Thank you. Did this make sense at oh, all? God. Can't stop, won't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. Can't stop. Ah.